156. We are on record this morning on a number of motions. May I have the names of our participants, please? Good morning, Your Honor. Ariel Berger, here to be guardian ad litem. Ms. Tasha Thomas, counsel for the department. Chelsea Grant for the department. Good morning, Your Honor. William Amadeo, P76194 for the Department of Peer Reviews. Good morning, Your Honor. Alex Lizza, who will appear on behalf of the respondent father, who sits to my right. Uh, Matthew Virgil Higgins, Jr. All right. Your Honor, I do have to make a quick statement. I stand corrected in that the adjudicatory phase is different than the termination phase. And uh, yes, I confused that a little bit in my paperwork, but I, I already apologized to Sister Council. I sent an email previously that I stood corrected. So, but other than that, I mean, my motions still have validity, obviously. I have uh, approximately 11 motions uh, filed, counting the show cause. Does that sound right, Mr. Elizabeth? Um, One from petitioner, I think. I've got nine total. All right. Which ones would you like to address, if you could? I thought maybe the court would want to do it in the order that they were filed. Which motions do we want to address? First, the petition for the motion to quash, because the ruling by this court on that dovetails into two other motions, so we can handle three. Just, can you just tell me which motions you would you have that you would like answers to this morning? Um, response to the motion to quash, motion in limine regarding the CAC interview, motion in limine regarding the striking the CAC interviewer from the witness list of the petitioner. Uh, my, I've got two motions, counsel's motion, affidavit and motion for an order to show cause as to Leanne Higgins. Counsel's affidavit and motion to, as to order to show cause as to Todd Bailey. Respondent's motion in limine regarding defendant's convictions. Respondent's motion in limine as to not making any Test allowing any testimony as to the credibility of a witness. Uh, motion limine regarding uh, that no comment can be made about civic duty. And the last motion I have is the motion to amend the protective order to allow the CAC interview transcript to be disclosed to respondents expert. All right, Mr. Amadeo, Ms. Thomas, who's going to be taking point for today? I think that would be me. I don't know how, Mr. Amadeo, I don't know how um, long you're going to be able to be with us. Uh, that, that's true, Your Honor. I'm, I'm here as a backup today. I have some medical procedures going on, so I may have to log out, but I didn't want to not show up. All right, thank you. Does the summary of the uh, titles of the motions by Mr. Lizahu uh, sound like everything we need to tackle today? Yes, Your Honor. On Thursday, I did file a response with uh, a motion for protective measures. I don't know if those have been received by the court. I know that the clerks received them. I'm just not sure if they made their way into the file quite yet. And Your Honor, when appropriate, I think we need to discuss some of the discovery that was handed over to us. That was one of the things on our agenda today. Your Honor, I was not aware that there was going to be an issue regarding discovery. I wasn't either. I have a petitioner's notice of intent to use alternative procedures. Proposed uh, one dear questions and jury instructions and verdict form from respondent. Not sure I have your. Oh, here it is. Petitioner's consolidated response to respondents' motions. That's right. All right. Um, do you have a preference, Mr. Amadeo, as to whether or not we go right into the motions, or do you want to? Do you have something that we need to talk about at sidebar as relates to discovery? Uh, What's your? I think a sidebar briefly, Judge, that's acceptable. Okay. Any objections? Yeah. After the sidebar, which was basically just to 
um, establish, in my opinion, that the discovery had been exchanged and there may be some issues with it. We'll see what we can get to on that today. I would like to get through some of the motions that have already been previously filed and then we'll uh, discuss any new issues as they arise and whether or not we need to make more time for them. Anything else about the sidebar, counselors? Nothing ever. No, no, no. All right. For the record, Mr. Amadeo shook his head no. All right. Which one do you want to start with, Mr. Elizahu? Uh, we could start with the petitioner's motion to quash. Sure. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Edward. This motion was filed as a response to Mr. Lizenhoek's um, two subpoenas to Ms. Leanne Higgins and Mr. Chad Bailey. Um, I rely on the contents of my motion and the brief in support of the motion. I believe that the subpoenas were um, grossly outside the realm of what would be relevant in this matter. And I know that Mr. Lizenhoek also takes issue with the fact that we don't have standing to um, do this on behalf of a third party, I suppose, but that's contrary to the plain language of the um, court rules that are cited within um, my brief. <clears throat> so for those reasons, we do ask the court to consider that motion. Um, and part of that, you know, dovetails into Mr. Wizzle Hope's uh, show cause motions, um, but based on the court rule, the one of the uh, I guess prayers of relief would be to stay the subpoenas or to, um, yes, to stay them and so that they wouldn't, there wouldn't be any consequences. That was not uh, heard or dealt with before the date on the subpoena. So I understand that his position in filing those show causes, but um, I don't really have much more of an argument other than what I wrote. Okay, a response? Uh, is it okay that I said? Yes. Okay, thank you. Your Honor, the subpoenas were issued to Leanne Higgins and to Ted Bailey. They were seeking some social media documents for a limited period of time, as well as from Ted Bailey for certain text messages. Our position is that petitioner does not have start standing to object. Petitioner is not the subject of the subpoenas and do not have standing to assert the rights of third parties. Moreover, they do not claim any privilege. Secondly, the scope of discovery is open broad and liberal. There's no good cause requirement. The tendency in the case law is to broaden the scope of discovery, to facilitate preparation, to guard against surprise and to expedite justice. Any document is essentially discovery allows discovery of any document which is re relevant and not privileged, is freely discoverable upon request. A witness's credibility or bias is never irrelevant. We believe Leanne Higgins coached the minor child to fabricate allegations as payback. Uh, the media would, we believe, would contain similar communications to others of her bias and motive. We also believe that possibly the media will demonstrate that she's expanding the allegations to include more than what was uh, demonstrated in the uh, petition and the amendment to the petition. Leanne Higgins has had 21 CPS complaints involving the same children, physical abuse, drugging the children, threats to the children, retaliation, neglect. She blames respondent for everything. That's what happens in those, uh, the documents that have previously produced to uh, uh, counsel. And I included an excerpt of a text from Tad Bailey, Judge. The text obviously demonstrates that she is disseminating information regarding this matter to everybody she can demonstrate. And Tad Bailey actually corroborates that Leanne Higgins has has a motive and bias against my client. I don't want to say the words on the record. It's in the pleadings. Uh, I'll, I'll just pass over it. But I'll, I'll repeat it. I asked her, this is Ted saying this in the text. I asked Lee, her, Leanne Higgins, if she had anything to do with it because the two of them have a long past of trying to have each other over in the wrong 
in the worst way that they can. If she's sending this one, if we got a hold of this one text, we believe there's many other texts to many other persons regarding her motive and bias as against my client. I included Tad Bailey because obviously she's one that openly, she's one person that she's openly communicated with. So this is discovery judge. I'm interested in getting this information. We're willing to go through it. I will share it, of course. But I believe reasonably, a good faith, that there is other social media or communications in which she is slamming my client, expanding the allegations, trying to get people on her side, and basically uh, something that should be discovered so that I can use this in trial. Ms. Uh, Berger? Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Um, pursuant to MCR 3.992A2, um, additional discovery outside of the mandated initial disclosures um, may be permitted by the court only um, under the motion of a party. I don't believe I saw a motion uh, for leave requesting subpoenas to be filed um, or to be served on non-respondent parents or third parties. Um, also pursuant to the rule, um, absent manifest injustice, no motion for discovery should be granted unless requested, unless the information was requested from the opposing party and failed to be provided, or um, if the information was ordered by the court and not provided. So I'm not sure how social media um, login information for either of the individual subpoenaed is relevant or would be a manifest injustice if not permitted to be, I guess, had by respondent father. Can I respond, Judge? Uh, one moment. Did you have anything else to add, Ms. Thomas? Uh, yes, Judge. And, and part of my uh, motion was also to, um, I guess, limit the scope of the subpoena as well. And that was part of the argument that I posed was um, <clears throat> we understood that at the last pretrial, being able to get these documents would require Mr. Ozoho to ask for them. And I believe he attempted to do that through those subpoenas. And <clears throat> that as Ms. Berger just cited in the court rule, we we're aware of that component. Um, part of the issue that we, or the issue that we take the most, <clears throat> um, yes, matter we take the most issue with is the subpoena itself is asking for log login username passwords for multiple social media accounts all messages all screenshots i mean this is a phishing expedition and although mr lizaho cites to this paragraph in which there's an exchange of uh, communication between leanne and tad it also states that Leanne couldn't believe that this happened either. And I think that that's contrary to his assertion that she's the one who's made this story up and is forcing them to make these disclosures. So again, I, I don't believe that any of this is relevant. If we're asking for them to be quashed and the alternative at least limited to specific relevant messages or posts, I guess. You wanted to respond? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, the court rule deals with us opposing parties. Leanne Higgins is not a party to the case as an opposing party. She's a non respondent She's a parent. She's not the respondent here. And I do not believe we can rely on the deponents themselves to determine which documents are relevant or not relevant. That's why I asked for all the documents so we could go through them. As far as asking for the documents, I did send an email to Leanne Higgins asking for these documents, she indicated to me, yeah, well, I'll produce anything you want. And then I asked specifically for these particular documents and she indicated she wasn't gonna comply. So, and as far as Tad Bailey, I have no way of emailing him. I don't know his email address. We had to serve him at a 7-Eleven by, by a phone call. So, I don't want to rely on them to produce to us what they believe is relevant. So that's why the subpoena was broad, so I could get the documents to see what is relevant. Of course, I'm going to share those documents with uh, brother counsel and sister counsel. 
but I need those documents from them. They're not opposing parties. All right, uh, it's your uh, motion, Ms. Thomas. Did you want to say anything else? Uh, your Honor, I, um, Ms. Higgins is technically by court rule uh, a party as um, MCR 3.903 subsection 20 party includes the petitioner and juvenile and delinquency proceeding, but also a petitioner with the child, a respondent and parent or guardian or legal custodian of protective proceeding. Um, while she's a non-respondent, she is a party to this case. And in these cases, we also don't necessarily have oppositional parties. We simply are here for the welfare of the children. Um, but as I say, the plain language of the court rule does permit a party. So whether that was Ms. Higgins or us to um, file the motion to quash, it's, um, it's permitted by court rule. We are asking the court to exercise its discretion um, and broad authority to limit discovery in this matter. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, the court finds all interested parties were given notice for purposes of this particular motion. Uh, the court rule does require a request to allow the discovery in the first place, which I did not have. So we just want to note that for the record. Uh, but secondarily, there is really no way to allow the production of these records without it becoming overbroad and uh, invasive. And because of the way that it's being asked for, uh, I will not order uh, anybody to turn over passwords and logins to social media accounts. Uh, I think that that, by very definition, would be allowing an overbroad exercise uh, of the discovery that's authorized under the court rules. Uh, there would be no way for me to limit it. And frankly, there would be no way for me to secure against uh, the production of uh, records in that fashion that would be reliable. So just by logging in to this person's account, whoever you're looking for to get these records for in the first place could have easily uh, manipulated or changed them at this point, knowing that you're asking for them. And secondarily, when I let you in there, there's no way that I don't know that you are going to be making changes to that information as well. So I don't think that there's any reason to allow for this because it's not going to be uh, reasonably reliable in any sense of the word in the way that it's being requested to be produced. Uh, if you wanted to send a subpoena directly to the companies uh, to lim and limit it to the time frame that's been uh, articulated, uh, which I think was summarized well by the contents of this particular motion, uh, July 20th, 2023 through August 11th, 2023. Uh, I may be inclined to allow that, but I would still need to know um, what exactly you're asking for. Would it be just Facebook posts? Is it just um, text messages? And you would need to get those from a reliable source, which would be directly from the companies. Daughter, um, I was going to amend my, I, what I plan to do now, we'll, I'll regroup with another motion, as, as you've indicated, and I'll probably ask for a discovery master, we'll pay for it, and we'll go through the paperwork, make sure that stuff that's produced is relevant to the case, I don't have an issue with that. If you want to file a motion and show me why you, I mean, I understand why you want them. So I guess I'm on notice as far as that goes because of the uh, petitioner's uh, motion and your response. Um, so let me just clarify that my ruling is that if you want to seek records directly from companies, yes, you can ask me to issue those subpoenas and I will review them and they will be limited to the dates that I just indicated on the record. And the dates were July 20th, 2023 through what date, Your Honor? August, August 11th, 2023. Oh, thank you, Your Honor. So by extension, that does resolve the uh, two show cause motions uh, those would be denied. Do you want to put anything on the record about those? Just that 
um, that in the event we have an issue with the production from your honor subpoenas, then I don't want the denial of those show causes to be serve as any race judicata that I can't enforce your subpoenas against another party. I have authorized you only to seek information directly from the companies holding that information so that it's reliable. Um, so how would your response be relevant for that purpose? Your Honor, um, I don't know which phone service is used by Tad Bailey nor Leanne Higgins. Okay. So I could issue the, I could ask the court to issue those subpoenas, but I don't know which phone service I would issue them to. Well, then maybe your discovery uh, needs to be, your request for discovery needs to be amended then. Your Honor, I'll, I'll, I'll issue the subpoenas to all the major phone companies. It's up to you, however you want to do that, Mr. Lizzie. That's what I'll do, thank you. All right, so then by extension, the motion to show cause, Tad, Tad as well as um, Leanne Higgins are both denied. Thank you. All right, which um, motion would you like to tackle next? Could we uh, do the motion in limine regarding the CAC interview? Is that the motion to, which motion is that? It looks like there's two motions around about the CAC interview. One is the um, prevent any use of the CAC interview from use at trial. Okay, you want to take that one first? Yes. Your motion to strike the CAC interviewer from petitioner's witness list filed December 4th, 2023? No, the actual CAC interview from any use of trial. I was concerned that because they listed the interviewer that they would attempt to use the interview itself at the trial. So your motion in limine to preclude the CAC interview from any use of trial? Yes, Your Honor. Go ahead. Your Honor, uh, as this court knows, it's an adjudication matter for the jury. Statute states, MCL 712A.17 B5, specifically accepts or precludes the use of the uh, CAC interview from the trial. I'm asking for a court order that precludes the use of the CAC interview altogether from the trial. Response? Yeah, in my response, I simply said it was frivolous. It's the plain language of the court rule or the statute. I'm very aware of it. Mr. Amadeo is very aware of it. We've never sought, we were not seeking to bring that in. Um, but the court rule also states that the CAC interview can be played at every other hearing. So to the extent that, you know, this would probably get brought up too, to the extent we bifurcate the adjudication phase and the dispositional phase, we wanted to play at the dispositional phase. There's nothing precluding us from doing that. Um, but at this time, we've never suggested that it could be played at the adjudication phase. Um, I think an order is quite unnecessary. I think using this court's time to make a ruling on that is quite unnecessary. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Ms. Berger? I think I'll be done. Okay. Anything else, Mr. Lizardo? Not on this motion, Judge. Okay. Uh, you can draft an order that simply says that the court and all parties uh, recognize the court rules authority and we'll follow up. There's no indication that uh, any of our parties or attorneys were intending to break it. What's, uh, which motion would you like to take next? The next motion, Judge, is to strike the interviewer from the petitioner's witness list. Okay, go ahead. There was a CAC interview conducted August 7th, 2023. The interviewer was Janice Siddons. Ms. Siddons was actually listed on the petitioner's witness list. And she's not involved in any other way in this case, other than having been the interviewer. 
And since the actual interview is inadmissible as a matter of law, the purpose of her testifying wouldn't be, wouldn't be there. So I want to make sure that she's not called and makes reference to the interview in any manner, whether the protocol was followed, whether the interview actually took place, anything involving Janice Siddons' testimony is absolutely irrelevant. Response? Hey, Aaron, I also responded to that in my consolidated response. Um, that individual was included because, as this court is very much aware, part of the investigation process is when our C, uh, CPS workers sit in on those interviews. I mean, it's a little different with a private agency handling these cases rather than the uh, prosecuting office when uh, law enforcement would also submit this to the prosecuting office. Um, but for those reasons, uh, the allegations of the petition themselves, um, whether they're reliable and whether the protocol was fo followed in order to be um, that trustworthiness it, uh, in the drafting of the petition, I, I think is relevant. Um, and as I had explained to Brother Counsel, we did that as a courtesy, essentially, to say, like, hey, if you have questions about whether the petition, the allegations contained in the petition are, um, I guess there's an indication of trustworthiness in them, then this person could answer whether they followed the protocol or not. And it, there's nothing besides no case law, no statute or anything that says we can't bring up the fact that an interview was had. So for those reasons, um, I also don't see any law citing that anyone who's on a witness list must be called or that there's any standing to strike people from my own witness list. Um, so for those reasons, we're asking that the witness list stay, uh, stand as um, Ms. Berger? Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, although the contents of the interview cannot be testified to, I do believe the uh, forensic protocol in issuing an interview can. Uh, and I do believe that it, it's important for all parties to be able to ask if those protocols were followed, if they're accurate, if, um, if they indicated truthfulness or not uh, in that reporting, and specifically because there are statements in the petition. So there, there is a reasonable likelihood that someone would have questions regarding those um, statements and uh, would need to verify those with the interviewer themselves, not necessarily what was said, but how the interview was conducted. So I think that it's relevant to, and important to keep her on the list. Your Honor, the interview can't be used whatsoever before the jury. For them to suggest that they can talk about it in front of the jury is simply wrong. This is letting the camel's nose under the tent. Right, right, right. There's no, he provides no law to support that. The petition itself states that it also went through a CAC interview. It's in the petition, it's going to be read to the jury. So they're trying to do indirectly what they can't do directly. They want the. Did anyone look to see if there's any case law on this? Because I cannot imagine that this is an issue of first impression. All right, let's table that one for now. I'd like you all to have a look and see if there's any case law that would offer us any guidance on that point. So we'll pass that one over. And if we go into the lunch hour, you'll have your assignment while you're eating your sandwich. All right, next motion. Um, my next motion is a motion in limine as to the respondent's criminal convictions. All right. He's had three prior uh, convictions. Uh, one was February 7th, 2006 for controlled substances. The second one was August 6th, 2007, embezzlement and larceny. Both of those are 10 years old and excludable pursuant to MRE 609C. And then the third conviction is uh, from December 26, 2015, failure to pay child support. We believe it's irrelevant and any probative value is substantially outweighed by unfair prejudice. We're asking that a motion limine be entered precluding any use or reference to such convictions. Response? Uh, Your Honor, for aware of, again, Court rules, rules of evidence. We know it applies. We've never indicated that we would 
attempt to use those. Um, so I guess, again, it's just a waste of this court's time to make a ruling on that at this point, but we concur with the rules of evidence. Any comments? None. Very good. All right, uh, Mr. Lizahoub, you're welcome to draft an order that says that the court rule uh, is recognized and all parties and attorneys are anticipated to file. Your Honor, the one um, conviction is within uh, within 10 years, the one Which regarding one the failure to pay child support. We don't believe that should be allowed to be introduced before the jury. Did you, I, did you have any intention of using that? No, Your Honor, and I just want to make clear that there are very, in my brain, there are two separate proceedings here. Um, so to the extent that we need to use that for adjudication, no, but if we use that at best interest phase or for grounds for termination, um, that remains up to our discretion. So uh, for those first, I just want to make very clear that, sure, for jury trial itself, no intention in using those. Um, but after that, I don't know Mr. Amadeo's game in there. Um, just briefly, Your Honor, obviously we know how this plays out with adjudication trials. If we go to best interest, I think a lot of things become fair game as you become the complete purveyor of what comes in, what does not come in. We certainly are not going to violate a court rule or use prior convictions at the adjudication phase. We've been very clear on that, Judge. All right. Um, I also think that that would not be admissible under the court rule because it is not... It doesn't speak to the credibility of your client or his capacity for truthfulness. So again, I think the language that the court rule will be followed is sufficient to make a ruling on your motion in that point. Thank you, Your Honor. But I would recognize uh, that Mr. Amadeo and Ms. Thomas do make a good point. What we're talking about with regard to all of your motions, really, is what's happening in front of the jury at the adjudication trial, not a disposition, because the court rules are different. That govern disposition. I understand, Judge. Which motion would you like to address? Uh, the motion in limine, a witness cannot comment or provide an opinion on the credibility of another witness. All right, go ahead. A uh, witness is not allowed to comment or provide an opinion on the credibility of another witness because credibility matters are to be determined by the jury. Consequently, I'm, I want an order restricting or prohibiting any witness commenting or providing any opinion on the credibility of another witness. People versus Dobek. And um, what is your concern with, with this particular case as far as credibility? Because that's also governed by the court rules. Credibility can be challenged by a witness's capacity for truthfulness or impeachment. I'm certainly not going to prohibit them from exercising their right to do that under the court. I do not want a witness stating that they believe another witness or that witness is credible, saying, saying another witness is credible. I'm talking about the opinion of other witnesses being credible or not. Um, Ms. Thomas? Um, I'll respond Ms. to this one, Judge. First of all, there's going to be sequestration. That's pretty common, so I'm not sure how a witness would even comment on the credibility of another witness. That's number one. Number two, Judge, I don't believe lay people can give opinions, at least in the hundreds of jury trials I've done. So I don't really see what's going on here. However, for impeachment, as you know better than myself, things become fair game, but we're not trying to violate the court rules, Judge, and I think this is a recurring theme in these motions. So... I'm not really sure where Mr. Liza Hope's going with this, Your Honor. Any comments, Ms. Berger? Yes, thank you, Judge. Um, for one, the cases that the petitioner in this motion is citing to are criminal cases. They're not um, abuse, neglect, or dependency cases. Um, in addition, the language that they use in cite to a case um, is not actually the language that's listed in the case. The language that they're attempting to use is that a witness is not allowed to comment or provide an opinion on the credibility of a witness. But as Ms. Thomas states in her motion, 
the actual language of the um, case site is that it is generally improper for a witness to comment or provide an opinion on the credibility of another witness because credibility matters are to be determined by the jury. In addition, um, the criminal cases that they also cite to um, state that an expert may not vouch for the veracity of a victim. So at this point, we're not asking for any of those things to happen, but limiting the questions related to bias and credibility of a witness is always going to happen <laughs> in any type of case. We have to make sure that the statements that were made are accurate and believable. So I don't believe that we can limit questions related to credibility of, um, of witnesses talking about, you know, other, other witnesses or the child, which I believe this is where this is going, um, their propensity to tell the truth or not. Any further comment, Mr. Lizzo? Your Honor, yes, a witness can be impeached, of course, but for a witness to go on the stand and say, well, I heard the child's story and I believe it. That's not, that should not be allowed. The witness can testify about what they might have heard, which is hearsay, but you know, what they might have seen, but they cannot render an opinion and the credibility of another witness. This is basically also kind of like in the penumbra of Janice Siddons testifying, you know, I was concerned about that. But uh, the witness cannot comment or provide an opinion on the credibility of another witness. Thank you. I think this uh, motion can also be resolved by just simply recognizing that all parties and attorneys will be following uh, the court rules on those points. Credibility is uh, admissible under the court rules under certain circumstances, and that's what will cover our proceedings. Which motion would you like to tackle next? Uh, motion in limity that the petitioner cannot appeal to the jury's civic duty. You may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, a party cannot appeal to a jury's civic duty because this would wrongfully encourage jurors to suspend their powers of judgment and infringe upon their duties. So my, my motion is for an order that petitioner cannot say to the jury, well, look, you know, this is involving a kid. You have to do this civic duty kind of thing. And it's just not, not a proper argument to be used in front of a jury. You cannot encourage the jurors to suspend their powers of judgment. Response? I can respond briefly to this one, Your Honor. Um, unless Ms. Thomas wants to. So in the opening, Your Honor, which I think where Mr. Liza Hope is going, you know, we can only discuss the evidence, what the evidence will show in the closing. I don't know what I'm going to say, but openings and closings are not evidence, as we very well know. And as far as civic duty, I think he's trying to argue that we're attempting to prejudice the jury against his client. Pretty simple. We're going to argue the facts. So I don't even know. I never heard of appealing to a jury's civic duty. And I think he's trying to argue that this will be prejudiced by appealing to the jury at all, which doesn't make sense. Once again, Your Honor, I would simply say we could adhere to the court rules and call it a day on that. Uh, Ms. Berger? I've got the Any other comments? Mr. Lizenhoop? No, Your Honor. All right. Uh, I would uh, concur with Mr. Amadeo. There is a general theme here of worrying about things that uh, will possibly happen. Uh, so, you know, I'm making these rulings, recognizing, again, that we're going to be following the court rules and following the statutes. Um, I think your motions are at best premature. Uh, and in, in anticipating that uh, there will be violations of the court rules or statutes, which I can understand why the department doesn't appreciate that. And I don't appreciate it either because we really intend to make sure that we are following the court rules and the statutes. Your Honor, the reason I brought these motions in limine is 
is you can't unring a bell. And when the jury hears something and we argue about it, even though the jury's out of the room, they're going to hear it. So I just want it to be pro proscriptive, trying to handle these matters in a matter before a jury could hear anything about that. Mr. Liz, there is a litany of issues that have been litigated and appealed that we could, under your logic, be here for days litigating against in anticipation of the jury. So let's get through your motions, but please keep that in mind in the event that you decide to file future motions. Thank you, Your Honor. Because I can understand why the department uh, would be asking for some kind of compensation as a result of having to spend so much time uh, litig litigating against things that uh, have already been decided by prior courts are unreasonable. But go ahead. What's your next motion? The motion to amend the protective order to allow my ex um, respondent's expert to view the transcript of the CAC interviews. Go ahead. Uh, Your Honor issued an order on November 7th, 2023, and I'm reading within the four corners of the order. The order does not allow the CAC interview transcript to be viewed by the respondent's expert. We did name an expert. We filed the expert's curriculum vitae with the court. He's a recognized expert. He's been cited in case law, and I'm not interested in violating your honor's order and that's why i filed this motion response your honor if you who are the most important person in this trial feel he has an expert and you feel he, that expert can review this cac that's fine but it's not for him to determine who the expert is i've explained this to him multiple times judge if he wants to have someone who he deems to be an expert, that's for you to decide it, for him to request a Dahlberg hearing. We're not just going to say, well, Mr. Lyshope says it's an expert. That's good enough for us. We don't make that decision, Your Honor. You do. So this motion, in the nicest possible way, is not right. If he has an expert with a CV that you approve or you approve after a Dahlberg hearing, by all means, have the expert review the CAC. But it's not for him to determine who that expert is. That's for you to determine. So for him to request that his expert reviews the CAC when you haven't determined if his expert is even qualified makes no sense, Judge. Ms. Berger? I don't think that. Mr. Lewis here? Your Honor, we identified an expert on our witness list. We also filed the expert's Credentials with the court. <coughs> I have it here. Yes, I see that you have filed that. Uh, is there a reason you haven't asked for a hearing to qualify him formally as an expert? Well, I, I believe that this I believe that uh, this motion would allow me to do that because I, I from reviewing the his resume, which I filed on December 12th, I saw no opposition from brother or sister counsel as to his credentials whatsoever. So I believed I was able to move forward with this. And may I briefly respond to that, Your Honor? Go ahead. Brother and sister counsel did not stipulate to his expert because brother and sister counsel know that you have to approve this. So just because Mr. Lysenko provided a CV does not mean that you're going to determine this person to be an expert. This is not the proper way to approach this. Mr. Lysenko has to get your approval of the expert either through a stipulation or your approval without a hearing or to file a Dolbert hearing. Resumes can be compromised. I don't know if his expert's the best expert in the world or a complete hack. I don't know, but that's why we would get your approval, Judge, before determining such. So in no way did the department ever stipulate that his expert's qualified. That's for you to decide, not for us. I would concur uh, with the logic offered by Mr. Amadeo on this point, and I think that uh, it's important too, Mr. Lazoub, uh, for you to have an expert that's been recognized as an expert by this court. And the other attorneys uh, should have the opportunity to voir dire your expert before I make that determination. 
So I do, I'm going to deny your motion as premature uh, for those reasons. Any other uh, motions? No, Your Honor. All right. So we'll uh, take a recess uh, to allow you all to look at the uh, motion to strike uh, the CAC interviewer from the witness list and or uh, addressing the issue that has arisen with regard to what can be brought up in front of the jury. So allow you to do some research on that point. Uh, and I guess you can let me know. All right. Um, I believe it's our, it's the motion to, it was the, not necessarily the one to strike the CAC interviewer from the witness list, but the motion to preclude use of the CAC interview at trial that remained unresolved. Uh, would you agree, Mr. Lizahoo? I, Your Honor, I was under the impression it was to preclude Janice Siddons from testifying uh, that was my understanding, Your Honor. I think Your Honor said that, you know, clearly the statute didn't allow the CAC interview to be used at the adjudicatory phase. But I think the issue really was whether Janice Citizen, Cit, Cit, Citons, S I D D O N S, the interviewer for the CAC interview, could be allowed to testify. I agree with that, Your Honor. I believe that it is about whether um, Janice can testify. She is on her witness list. Um, and my position remains the same. Can I respond, Your Honor? One moment. Let me see uh, what Ms. Berger would like us to understand as her initial position as well. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. I was able to conduct some research um, over the break. Um, I do believe that it's proper to keep her on the witness list. I did also find case law. It wasn't a criminal case where the CAC interviewer did testify um, and did provide um, things such as forensic interviewing processes um, that was appealed and was not found well taken. So that was found to be proper, at least in a criminal case here in Michigan. Um, I can forward that to anyone who would like a copy of it, but um, I do believe that it's proper, and I do believe she actually could testify to some of the forensic procedures used in a CAC interview. All right. Uh, what was the case? Oh, you're muted. Sorry, I'm muted on instead of unmuting. Um, it's People versus Lake, Adam Lake, um, number 360058. It's an unpublished Ingham County case from what year july 2023 all right mr lizahoo were you able to conduct any research on the issue yes i did see uh, some criminal cases which discussed the uh, cac interviewer uh testifying but i uh focused instead on uh, cases involving uh, uh, case involving juvenile court and termination proceedings, um, and I could not find a case in the juvenile uh, system about the interviewing interviewer being allowed to testify at the ju adjudicatory phase of. Uh, the, the proceedings. I My position, Your Honor, is that uh, Janice Siddons is not an expert witness, has not been labeled as an expert witness. To allow her to testify as to the protocol, procedure, and the responses would be a de facto violation of MCL 712A.17B5 and doing something indirectly that could not be done directly. Her only testimony is regarding the CAC interview she, her repeat of Madison Higgins' statements would constitute an admissible hearsay. And it's my position that uh, she cannot testify whatsoever in these proceedings. 
All right, did you want to add anything to the discussion as far as research that you may have found, Ms. Thomas? Yes, thank you, Your Honor. There is limited uh, case law through protective proceedings and child welfare proceedings regarding the specific matter. I think the closest that I was able to find is an unpublished case from 2018 um, in Ray Ortner, case number 341194. Um, How do you spell Ortner? O-R-T-N-E-R. Um, and it just sort of outlines the proper process um, and how uh, MCR 3.972 C2A and um, MCL 712A.17B, which is the statute governing the video recorded statements work in tandem. And I'll read into the record a portion of the case. And again, I understand it's not binding, but per, um, just persuasive given it is unpublished. So it states um, it, for their MCL 712A.17B5 requires the admission of a video recorded statement except in adjudication, so long as the question is in accordance with the forensic interview protocol. The proper procedure would entail having the forensic interviewer testify at adjudication, assuming compliance with MCR 3.972 C2A, followed by consideration of the forensic interview displayed on the DVD at the termination phase, assuming compliance with MCL 712A.17B. Stated otherwise, a video recorded statement can be used by the trial court to assess whether the circumstances surrounding the giving of the statement provide adequate indicia of trustworthiness, such, as, such that a proposed witness who took the video recorded statement should be allowed to testify about that statement made. Um, and that's quoting the MCL or MCR 3.972 C2A. With that, I do understand that the court rule specifically states um, for children 10 and under that child hearsay can be admitted and we have a tender years hearing, but the statute states for witnesses under the age of 16. With that, I, there's also another case um, that I found, which is in, uh, I'm sorry, People versus Abby, and again, this is unpublished, case number 303784, um, and this dates back to 2012. But there, the um, interviewer's testimony was also appealed, and the court held, um, other than indicating that the interviewer um, interviewed the victims have siblings, the interviewer did not testify any, to anything regarding uh, the content of the interviews because the uh, witness to testify. Willie, just the interviewer described her observation of the victim's behaviors while another individual conducted the forensic interview of the victim, but she did not express an opinion regarding the manner of handling the victim's interview, whether a forensic approach was used or the effectiveness of this um, technique. She simply described her personal observation of the victim, which coincided with the testimony of other witnesses. Um, and so I, I read this, and again, this is about a CPS worker, not necessarily someone who completed the forensic interview, but um, what the court held was that the information was from that interviewer, the CPS worker, regarding what compromise in general forensic interview or technique served merely as a background information, and it did not result in the improper bolstering of a witness credibility. Um, and with that holding, I think that it can apply to what my stance has been. Um, these petitions and often criminal complaints are drafted from law enforcement and CPS being present at those interviews, you know, behind a glass window. They're not seen, um, but that's uh, the main source of information and our petition does include that. And so again, I believe that it is relevant for the interviewer to be on the witness list if there's any issues or questions about the truthfulness of those um, or the veracity, I guess, of the allegations that are contained in the petition. And I believe that our case law supports that. Yeah, you know, that would, if it, if if the interviewer or the CPS worker or whomever begins to give an opinion or vouch for the credibility of the minor, that infringes on um, the ability of the witness to testify as such. So I disagree with Sister Count. I, I do note there is not much authority whatsoever on this issue. And I would request the opportunity to provide supplemental briefing on this matter so the court is well informed uh, before it makes a ruling. How much time are you asking for? Judge, give me a week. I, I find it unnecessary. The case, even the case that Ms. Berger has found. It, it flat out says whether the victim's interview followed standard procedure was material to and 
probative of whether the victim's allegations were believable, which was central to the defendant's theory on the case. And here that is also what the defendant has been alleging through all of these motions. This isn't true. This isn't true. Well, I think it is. I mean, I, that we have to look at the interviewer, if we choose to call that person, to determine whether when this child made those statements, if it was credible to make a petition based on those statements. Sister counsel's references to a CPS worker, not a CAC interviewer. Um, and this is the CAC interviewer whom was listed by petitioner as a witness. And I'll note to the court judge that uh, it was not listed as an expert witness, just listed as a lay witness. Um, I, I'm just asking the opportunity to do that, Your Honor, for one week, please. I think that we have enough information to say that the interviewer may be called as a witness for purposes of discussion as it relates to the procedures used, not necessarily the uh, interview itself. Obviously, the interview is not uh, admissible, but it doesn't say that any, it doesn't go as far as to say that any reference to it or the methodology that was used in order to conduct that interview uh, is off limits. And I think a, a close reading of that is appropriate under the circumstances. I don't want to read more into uh, the statute than I than I would be allowed to, frankly. Uh, if you find additional case law that states otherwise, I'd be happy to look at that. And you're welcome to renew your motion. But I believe we have enough information. I have enough information at this uh, point to say that the motion to strike her from the uh, witness list as well as to prohibit her from uh, testifying uh, must be denied uh, given the fact that it has in fact in other non-controlling case law been the case where such a person did lend testimony uh, during both criminal proceedings as well as at least uh, one abuse and neglect proceeding so for those reasons uh, i am going to give you that limited ruling on that motion but i would leave it to you if you find something else uh, to bring it back and your honor just for clarification so i, I understand your ruling you indicated that Ms. Siddons could testify as the procedures used, but not as to the interview itself. Is that correct, Your Honor? Yes, because the statute prohibits the use of the interview itself at trial. But anything else that you may want to ask this person does not appear to be exclusively limited by the language of the statute. And I won't read that into it at this point. Thank you, Your Honor. I'm not on mute. All right. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for uh, the uh, research that you did on this issue, as well as the rest of the motions that were heard uh, this morning. At this point, it looks like everything is uh, resolved and ready to proceed for trial. Uh, would you agree, counselors? Your Honor, there's just a couple of things I know that we, I think, are due for a review hearing, and we did have a court report submitted at the last portion, so I would like time for that. But otherwise, I did file a motion for um, alternative procedures for the witness testimony, um, and in that, I, I cite the law, and I know that this court must balance the um, competing interests of, you know, the state and Mr. Higgins. Um, but in my research, I was also reminded that uh, this is not a criminal proceeding, and Mr. Higgins is not entitled to the, the Sixth Amendment does not, um, I guess, avail itself to Mr. Higgins in these proceedings that there is a need for direct face-to-face -face confrontation with a witness. Um, and additionally, based on, and this is a little premature to say, but based on the court reports and the therapeutic notes that are included in it, um, and from that review, uh, the testimony and seeing Mr. Higgins um, is posing some psychological harm to these children. And so we would ask that the court find it appropriate to allow the child to testify with a closed circuit um, video recording so that, or uh, live streaming so that Mr. Higgins can witness the testimony, but that the child cannot see him. Um, and I believe that that was, uh, that's my motion as far as it relates to the alternative uh, measures for that testimony. I so if, one second. So if we were to implement what you're asking of what that seems to me would be that she would be zooming in and we would have the camera in the courtroom essentially focused on probably the podium. And then whatever attorney wants to ask her questions would be visible to her, but not necessarily uh, the whole courtroom. One of the ways that we've done this, at least in Monroe County, one, one way that I would propose um, was essentially an in-camera interviewing um, the testimony to question of the witness, where there was a camera in chambers um, and the attorneys one by one were allowed or together went back and uh, took the examination of the child in, in chambers. 
So the child decided to come to court. The jury was still allowed to see that and it was plain, but we, the attorneys were in person to question that witness. So my understanding is that the psychological effect on the child would be as a result of her father being present? Of her seeing her father. Not necessarily the jury. Correct. So in your scenario, uh, wouldn't it be reasonable to suggest that Mr. Lizagoop's client were to step out and be able to view the proceedings remotely versus everyone else moving? That I have, I don't believe I have, I mean, I was referred to the LJL um, based on the brief research I did on the point, it, the closed circuit um, question or whatever that, you know, that's permitted by statute. That's what I was deferring to. I don't, I'm happy to discuss other ways to do that, but I know that one of the things that the court must consider is whether it's not just the nervousness of coming to court and testifying, but that there's actual harm to the witness from seeing the defendant. And so that's where my proposal came in of them not having to be present in the courtroom to see father or the witnesses or other people who are here that might be in the family and not called as witnesses, um, but sort of safeguarded from being in camera. Thank you. All right, Mr. Lizzie, go ahead. Uh, a couple of things. First, I think if anything, the jury should be able to see the witnesses in person. And secondly, Your Honor, I didn't know that this was up today. Um, quite frankly, I received this after hours on Thursday and pursuant to MCR 3.922 F2, I'm entitled to respond within seven days. I still have a few more days to look at this and I prefer to file a written response. Very well. Uh, Ms. Berger, do you wish to be heard uh, initially? Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Um, I am in support of some sort of alternative testimony. Um, I have been able to speak with the children pretty regularly um, and with their mother. And um, they, it was relayed to me that if she were permitted to testify, even via Zoom, that would take a lot of stress and anxiety away. Um, I know that they are kind of at a standstill in their therapy and can't get over that that initial hump in their services. So I would be requesting that she be permitted to testify via Zoom. Um, I didn't um, file a motion on that yet, but if I need to also file a motion, I will. Uh, could I make a comment, please? Sure. Um, the problem with Zoom is if I have documents that I want to present the witness, um, that becomes somewhat problematic. Um, that's my comment on that. Say that again. If I have documents that I want to give to the witness to look at and review and comment upon that might become problematic via Zoom. Thank you. Uh, well, I will give you the opportunity to uh, respond in writing. Uh, what I would probably do if I granted this uh, would be uh, to ask your client uh, to step out and we would give him a way that he could effectively be part of a Zoom meeting so that he can watch, uh, but wouldn't be, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be necessarily in the room for her testimony. And of course, we would need to make arrangements for you to be able to communicate with him, whether that's by cell phone or whatever, if you needed to during that testimony. But uh, I would, again, if I granted this, do it in a way that is um, targeted at alleviating the psychological risk to the child, but maintaining the integrity of our, of our proceedings. And of course, your client's right to confront uh, his uh, accuser. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. So, um, do we need to look for a time for your motion that would also allow for a review? Because I think our trial set for May. It is set for May, Your Honor. Will we be having a review today? I'm we can. Are you prepared to proceed with a review, Mr. Lizahoo? Um, no, I'm not actually. I mean, I, I just would say that we were noticed for it accordingly. I believe that our last trial, um, we did not get Ms. Grant's um, report on the record um, or any of the documents contained there. And I want to say maybe this would be our first review or we haven't had one since October. Um, and I know that given that they are with an understand apparently that sort of extends our, our timelines. So I'll leave it to this court's discretion, but we are prepared to provide the court report um, today. 
Well, uh, if we want to give Mr. Lisa Hoop enough time to respond in writing to your motion, and I can give you a ruling on that as well as conduct the review. Uh, I do have some time a week from today. We're an hour on the afternoon of Tuesday the 13th. So we would be adjourning, but not for very long. What time on the 13th, Your Honor? Three. I'm available all, all day on the 13th, Your Honor. If it's three, that's fine. Ms. Berger? I can make that work. All right. Well, let's uh, schedule your motion as well as a review for Tuesday, February 13th at 3 o'clock p.m. Your Honor, can we attend by Zoom on that motion? Yes. Okay, thank you. Any other issues as we, it looks like that's gonna be our last court date before uh, trial. Um, Your Honor, I, I'm gonna follow up in, on my witnesses' qualifications. So uh, I plan to do that just so everyone knows. Very good, I'll look forward to that. We'll schedule that uh, upon receipt. Thank you, Honor. All right, all prayer orders remain in full force and effect. We'll see you all next week. Thank you again for your efforts. I, I, I apologize. What, I have, just a housekeeping matter, Judge. Do you want me to prepare the orders, or is your Honor's court going to prepare the orders? Uh, no, Mr. Lizzie Hoop, uh, I would ask you to prepare the orders that uh, came as a result of your motions. Uh, the adjournment of the review hearing itself, uh, I'll, I can handle that one. I will go ahead and issue that order to adjourn. And then if you could just do, did you notice you were a motion already for, for the uh, protective measures? I did not, Your Honor. All right, do you want to just do a notice of hearing then for next week? Yes. Okay. And so all the rest of the motions, Mr. Lizzie Hoop, I will ask you to prepare those orders. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, we are back on record in this case, getting ready to uh, proceed towards trial. So we're looking for any other uh, motions. This is our final pretrial. Can you have the names of our participants, please? Good afternoon, Your Honor. Ariel Berger here as the guardian ad litem for the minor children. Nastasia Thomas, counsel for the department, and at present is Ms. Nikki Jones, who is the CPS investigator, and Ms. Chelsea Grant, who is the ongoing caseworker. Ms. Jones, will you please put your um, appearance on the record, followed by Ms. Grant. Nikki Jones, CPS investigator for the Department of Health and Human Services. Chelsea Grant with the Department of Health and Human Services for the ongoing worker. Good, good afternoon, Judge. Uh, Alex Lizahub appearing on behalf of the respondent who also is appearing by Zoom. Mr. Higgins, would you be so kind as to introduce yourself for the record, please? Uh, yes, I'm Matthew Virgil Higgins, Jr. Very good. All right, one of the issues that's been adjourned to today is the uh, issue of the intent to use alternative procedures. Uh, I did receive a response. Uh, do we want to take that up first? Sure, Judge. Okay, Ms. Thomas, why don't we start with you on your position, then we'll let Mr. Lizzie respond. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, as it relates to the motion, in it, I have cited the court report that was admitted, for, or I'm sorry, submitted for admission. Uh, wow, that is not correct. It was submitted in anticipation that we would have testimony on it at the last or at a prior pretrial in January. Um, so I'm not sure if at this time it's appropriate to take that testimony from Ms. Grant to admit to the court report, um, but I am happy to move forward on my motion regardless at this time. All right. Um, it sounds like we may need some uh, testimony on it. So, Mr. Lizzie did you have any comments before we turn to testimony? Uh, I no, Your Honor. I've stated our position uh, in the response and for the court to uh, hear evidence and make specific findings. Um, and uh, to the extent the court finds that, then obviously the court has the jurisdiction to allow those alternative means. Um, so I did state everything. I know, just, just as a comment, Judge, I know Sister Counsel said tele-video conferencing, but Your Honor <laughs> discussed that the respondent could leave the courtroom during the testimony of the uh, child witness. And I believe that would be better logistically and better for the jury to be able to determine the credibility of the witness to see the person directly as opposed to by camera. Uh, I, only, I only say this, Judge, if you do determine that alternative means are necessary, I would request that 
my client be able to view those proceedings contemporaneously and that I be able to contemporary, contemporaneously be able to communicate with my client, uh, attorney client uh, privileged uh, during those proceedings and that the children likewise be uh, advised that uh, their father is also viewing the uh, proceedings. Uh, any initial comments, Ms. Berger? I am in support of the request um, for the, um, I guess, the plan for testimony of the minor children. Um, I was hoping we could do um, something where they could connect virtually and dad could stay in the courtroom. But if that is not possible, then uh, I would be in agreement. Thank you. All right. Witness testimony. Ms. Thomas. Uh, thank you, Ms. Grant. Can please be sworn in. And as the ongoing worker, did you prepare a court report that was submitted on or about January 2nd of 2024? I did. And um, what was um, what was the purpose of that court report? Uh, there was a review hearing at that time. So um, I completed the court report for the review as well as supplying all of the requested documentations, including um, trauma assessments that were completed, um, counseling updates from the referrals that were made. And since you've submitted this court report, have you circulated any further documentation regarding these children? I have not at this time. Are there any updates or modifications that you're aware of that need to be made to your court report or any of the attachments? At the time, no. Um, we are in the process of the counseling right now. The contract is ending for the 12 sessions with um, the recommendations from the current counselor coming in with um, what that would look like for future, either refer renewing the recommendations for the counseling or exploring new counselors. Um, we're going to hold that thought because I think that it's going to tie into um, a little bit about the motion as well. But as it relates to your initial court report, <clears throat> um, generally, how would you say the children are doing? They they have adjusted to being in mom's home. Um, each one has a different, obviously, level of understanding about what had happened and what brought them here, um, each based upon their own experiences. Um, overall, at mom's house, they seem to enjoy their placement. They do miss old friends, activities, those types of things. But the home environment itself needs being met. Things are going well. And have you met with the children personally? I have. Um, and during your meeting with the children, have you been able to discuss their um, right to participate in these court proceedings? I have. And um, what is their opinion on that? Yeah, and I, I'd object as hearsay. Their parties, Judge. Well, now also the rules of evidence don't apply in these proceedings only as it relates to adjudication. Thank you. Uh, I would concur. Uh, so for both of those reasons, the objection is overruled, but duly noted for the record. You may answer the question. Um, so two of the youngest, um, the two L's, um, do not wish to participate in any of the hearings. Um, the two oldest, who are both um, MH, so uh, the male and female have both um, stated that they do wish to like observe, understand what's going on, maybe not necessarily participate, um, but they do have a lot of anxiety about like upcoming courts and trials and want to know like how it works, who would be there, who would be where. In your report, you indicate that um, the, the subject minor who is um, the alleged victim in this matter had a lot of questions uh, for you regarding that process. Is that fair to say? That is. Okay. And included in your court report on the last page, there is a letter from a therapist. Um, the therapist is treating or working with a family. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, so Ms. Elliott, have you had the opportunity to speak with her about the children's progress um, and their goals of treatment? Several times. Yes. I would object as the hearsay. Mr. Lizzie, are you, this is a pretrial review. Um, the rules of evidence don't apply other than at uh, adjudication. 
So are, what is the purpose of your continued objections? Well, my understanding, Your Honor, was that the court itself was to interview the children to determine the need for um, alternative procedures. That's not, okay. So let me try just, why are you continuing to object on the basis of hearsay? Do you contest that the rules of evidence should apply to this particular proceeding? Help me understand why you continue to raise that objection. Well, I'm just make, I'm making a record judge and I understand that the rules of evidence don't necessarily apply to these types of procedures, but I still want to make my objection. Okay. Well, the objection is denied. Um, and just understand that, um, we're, we're, we need to get through this hearing this afternoon. So if it's unduly delayed by objections that you don't, that you understand do not apply, uh, I'm, that's not going to go over well this afternoon. Let's just put it that way. Thank you, Judge. Very good. You may answer the question. Can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. Um, have you had the opportunity to speak with Ms. Elliott? Yes. And you, in your prior testimony, you stated several times. Is that accurate? That is accurate. Okay. And in your conversations with Ms. Elliott, do her um, concerns or noticings in professional opinion match that of the letter that she wrote and provided dated December 30th, 2023? They do. Okay. And specifically that the two older kiddos, M and M, um, have had a conversation about um, testifying in front of this court, that there's anxiety around it that they do not wish to see their, or well, I suppose this is just for the female that she does not wish to see her dad in person, nor the family member to be there to support her. Is that accurate? That remains accurate. Yes. And is that, um, has that child also said the same thing to you? Yes. Um, the only difference is she had stated that she would be willing to testify. She just really does wish not to see dad or any supportive family members of dad. You mentioned in your earlier um, testimony that the referral for counseling was essentially closing out, right? That's referred for 12 sessions and then it needs to be renewed. Um, where is, where did that stand as of today? So the two youngest, sorry, I had to make sure I didn't say their names. Um, the two um, youngest males um, just finished up their sessions. I want to say about two and a half, three weeks ago, um, along with um, the two oldest the week prior. Um, they, all the boys had successfully met their goals that they had during sessions. Um, however, there was a recommendation for, um, the minor female to transition to a trauma-based therapist to talk about, um, the concerns related around what brought her into care and what removed her from her dad's care. Um, she will talk a little bit about it, but the emotions become overwhelming for her to talk about it. And this in-home therapist believes she would be more beneficial with a trauma specialist compared to what she is able to offer in home. Uh, did you review the trauma assessments that are included in your court report? I did. And do any of the trauma assessments for the youth indicate that there is, in fact, post-traumatic stress disorder um, diagnosis or uh, that the criteria cannot be ruled out? Yes. Um, I can't remember specifically. I believe at least two of the, the boys do have that. And that was also true for the um, female friend. That is possible. I would have to review it. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's been several uh, weeks ago. Um, as it relates to the trauma assessments, have you been able to make any referrals for the recommendations that are included on those? We have begun working on them. So the um, therapist looked over each and every one of the children's trauma assessments um, and identified those with her strengths and needs in her ongoing treatment and if she would recommend um, moving forward with their services or not. Um, or recommend, you know, moving forward with their services or not based upon those. Um, I know um, Ms. Higgins has also worked on um, IEPs and getting those reestablished. Um, they needed to be renewed from the onset. Um, and that's kind of where that has been. Um, we got the referrals just before Christmas. And then 
Um, we have been working on, you know, meeting the addition, the first needs of counseling first, and then moving towards um, the academic needs. Is there anything else you'd like to bring to the court's attention from your court report or the trauma assessments um, or any of your knowledge is for purposes of review? Not at this time. Your Honor, at this time, I would move to admit the court report that was submitted in early January with... No objection. No objection, Your Honor. All right, the court report and the exhibits. Yes, Judge. All right, so I heard the court report, but not the exhibits bit. Is there uh, any objection to the uh, attachments? No. No, Your Honor. Thank you, they are admitted. Uh, Cross-examination, Mr. Lizahu? None, Your Honor. Ms. Berger? No, thank you, Judge. Very well. Any other witnesses for purposes of our pre-trial review then, Ms. Thomas? No, Your Honor. Very good. Um, well, Mr. Lizahu, just to confirm, uh, did you want any, to hear from anyone for purposes of the pre-trial uh, review? No, Your Honor. Ms. Berger? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Very well. Okay. Any, do you want to go back to the other issue, Ms. Thomas? Do you want to make a ruling on the pretrial uh, review aspect? What's your preference? I would, um, at this time, just offer a brief argument on the motion for an alternative measures. Go ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, the Court of Appeals has repeatedly uh, stated, and specifically in Ray Brock, that the Respondents' Sixth Amendment rights to confrontation do not apply in child protective proceedings. Although that is true, we are asking, um, and we do not wish to violate any of Mr. Higgins' rights whatsoever, but we are asking this court to utilize its um, broad authority as it relates to providing these witnesses that may be called with protective measures so that they may um, be protected from further trauma. Um, specifically, if uh, no one else, we are asking that the alleged victim in this matter um, be allowed to testify outside of the view of Mr. Higgins. We have no objections to that testimony um, being obtained through one closed circuit, which is what most of the resources that I've been able to find in case law um, and statute provide. Um, and as this court mentioned also there uh, at the last hearing that there could be a possibility where Mr. Higgins is um, outside of the courtroom, but able to watch the proceedings contemporaneously and have instant access to his attorney. Both are agreeable to the department. The main issue is to protect the child and safeguard from any fur further harm. Um, and while that one's the most obvious, we do ask that this court consider it for the remaining children as well, to the extent that they're called. Um, I, that's going to be on Mr. Amadeo to choose the witnesses that he um, deemed necessary. But given the nature of the petition, um, the information that's contained in the court report and the trauma assessments, it seems that none of the children are interested in a relationship with their father, um, even as it relates to seeing, um, receiving gifts or cards for him, let alone seeing him. So for those reasons, we are asking this court to grant um, an alternative procedure for witness testimony at trial for the subject minors. So, Ms. Um, Thomas, if I were to say that it would appear, if I grant the motion, that the most efficient way to move on your request would be to allow the child uh, to testify remotely using Zoom so that Mr. Lizahub and his client wouldn't have to leave uh, the courtroom, but she would obviously be uh, very much visible uh, to members of the jury at that point without having to uh, see that her father is involved in that proceeding uh, necessarily. Where would your request be for her to testify from? Your Honor, originally, um, and I, I believe I say this at the last pretrial, my only experience in this, and I probably should defer to Mr. Amadeo, but is to um, set a Zoom up, I suppose, um, in chambers or in another room within the court so that if the child did need to be approached for any reason, the child is actually full. Um, but I, that would be my preference. But if I may defer to Mr. Amadeo on that point. Um, thank you, Judge. May I speak on it briefly? You may. Um, historically, what I've seen done in this situation, to echo what Ms. Thomas said, was we would put the child maybe in the jury room or someplace close where we knew sequestration wasn't violated and there was a decent Zoom connection. 
That way, the preservation of confrontation clause is still in place, but the child does have the protective measures. That's usually done via stipulation, Your Honor. I don't know if Mr. Lysop is going to stipulate to that, but based on past practice on these cases, that is traditionally how this can be accomplished. Thank you for that clarification. All right, argument, Mr. Lizahoo. Uh, Your Honor, um, if this um, court finds that alternative means are necessary, then I would uh, suggest that the child or the children in question sit in the uh, witness box in the courtroom that I'd be allowed to directly uh, ask questions of the child. I'd be allowed directly to hand those exhibits to the child. And that although I understand they, the other side wants Mr. Higgins to be outside the courtroom, if he is going to be outside the courtroom, that he communicate with me contemporaneously by uh, electronic means. And I don't see the need for me to be excluded from being able to ask the witnesses directly. Um, and I also believe that all the children need to be advised that Mr. Higgins is viewing their testimony as well. I think that if you take the children and put them in a jury room that uh, kind of puts up a barrier between the jury and the witness. And it also logistically makes it difficult for me to hand potential exhibits to such a uh, witness in another room. So I think for expediency and it logistically and ex is best that in following your suggestion last week, judge that uh, Mr. Higgins may, may leave the room, but uh, I think the procedure should continue with witnesses being examined in front of the jury itself. Your Honor, may I briefly respond to that? Um, well, I have uh, some follow-up questions for Mr. Lizahu first, so just sure. hang on a minute. Okay, thank okay you. Mr. Lizahu, so let me make sure I understand your position. Um, your primary position is that you oppose the motion and you would like the child to testify in front of the jury as well as with your client in the room. Is that right? Yes, Your Honor. Your second choice would be to uh, remove your client from the room? Yes, Your Honor. All right. What exhibits do you propose or do you think uh, you would need to have access to the witness to directly in order to uh, present your case? There are uh, text messages uh, that were created by the children, which I have shared with uh, counsel which I believe I would need to present directly to the witness. How many pages of text messages are you going to be asking the child to look at? Not many, just a few pages. Were there text messages in particular that you're going to be uh, asking about? Yes, I am, Your Honor. Okay. Is that the only exhibit? That's the only ones that I plan to hand the witness correct. Thank you. Witness says right, uh, more, more than one witness. I'm sorry, what? I'm sorry. It, more than one witness is, is the text messages are going to be used on more than one witness. All right. My understanding is that the child concerned by this particular notice uh, concerns the victim and not... Well, okay. Is it on all four of the children? Let me clarify that. It is, Your Honor. And as I stated, um, specifically for the vic the child victim, um, but we are including all children. Your Honor, can I respond to that, please? Go ahead. I believe the alternative methods doesn't apply to any child 16 or older. And one of the children is over 16, 16 and older. Okay, I know Mr. Amadeo wanted to uh, respond to something else that uh, he heard. Do you want to respond to that as well as your uh, for your additional comment? Uh, I think they're all going to go run together here, Your Honor. I just want to add for the record, and especially for appellate purposes, this issue has been established in criminal law at preliminary examinations where the stakes are higher as far as burdens of proof. And you do not have a right to have direct confrontation, and Zoom can clearly accomplish this. I just want to raise two other points, Judge, because I, I am concerned 
that this could lead to appellate issues as well. These text messages and such, what he wants to do can be accomplished, number one, by providing proper exhibits to your court for review prior to this. Number two, there's going to be authentication problems. There's best evidence rule issues. And more importantly, there's confusion of the issue. And I mean no disrespect by saying this, Your Honor, but some of the things Mr. Lysop has presented, I'm not quite following. And I'm not sure how that's going to be accomplished. I'm not even sure what his solution was here. But the court has been very clear. Mr. Higgins can have confrontation with the child being on Zoom in another room. That's been established. There's no way around that. There's no argument to say that confrontation is not meant. And I don't know which else to say there. It may work be it may create more work for Mr. Lies, I hope, but it certainly protects the integrity of the proceedings and more importantly protects the pallet rights. Ms. Berger. Judge, I think most importantly, it protects the child who has, no matter what, experienced a great trauma in her life. And even if um, Mr. Liza Hoop's argument is t found well taken by a jury, having this child be a witness just like a normal adult witness is going to cause additional trauma. So no matter what, she's experienced a break in the bond with a relationship with her father that she can't even appropriately address in regular therapy at this point. And I think that forcing her to testimony and forcing her to testify rather in the normal way would increase that and may actually not um, be favorable to anybody and just cause more trauma. So I would request that she be permitted to testify via Zoom, that any um, any documents that need to be shown to her, I would be more than happy to help with electronically, putting them up on the screen, um, screen sharing them. That way, whatever um, device she's using shows right up on her device. Um, that way we can do as much as we possibly can to um, to continue to protect this child. Well, it would appear that uh, the case would need to be made for each individual child that the uh, experience of testifying uh, would have an effect, uh, traumatic uh, and significant um, for each. And it ha would have to be, on, be beyond essentially just the experience itself. So uh, what is your opinion on those pieces, Ms. Berger, as well as the, uh, I mean, there is one child I think that is over 16, and I would think that this would not necessarily be something we could even offer to that particular witness. What are your thoughts? I would agree with that, Your Honor. Um, and I, when I, I don't need testimony from the two younger boys. Um, <clears throat> if they're planning on being called as a witness, then I would request that we provide the same procedures for them. They're triplets, so they're the exact same age. Um, and they're also delicate in, in their mental state as it relates to the claims. Um, they've been confused. They've questioned both parents. They've questioned what happened. They've tried to talk a little bit about it with their siblings and amongst themselves. Um, and I think that it's a trauma that's happened to this entire family, not just the child that directly experienced it. Now that they are away from it, they're recognizing that some of the things that they saw may not have been appropriate. So I would ask that the protections um, be engaged for the triplets and that the um, the oldest child, I don't I don't think that we have the, the basis to ask for that. Um, and I think he's pretty mature for his age. Your Honor, may I um, just make a brief comment? Sure. Um, so with all due respect to everyone's opinion and knowledge, um, I'm, and I looked at the bench book on this matter just to ensure that this motion was appropriate. So MRE, so the Model Rule of Evidence 611A, provides that this court has the broad discretion, regardless of age or disability, to allow for these protective measures. And the juvenile code that's cited in the motion is in addition to those powers um, that are vested in this court. And so both are um, cited in my motion for those purposes to cover all four children. Um, and of course, we leave it to this court's discretion as to whether those protective measures are appropriate for the four, but there is legal um, grounds for this court to do so. Uh, has any uh, professional counselor uh, been directly asked to speak to the issue for the minor children? No, Your Honor. 
would the department have available to it a professional to do that, whether it's the person that did the trauma assessments or uh, counselors? Ms. Grant, can you please speak on that? Uh, are you looking to see if like a counselor can speak for the children at trial or just if it would be detrimental to their well-being to testify? I guess I'm a little confused. Well, I'm asking if there's a professional that can um, look at the issue for the children that are under the age of 16 and identify whether or not it's just the process of testifying or if not only that, or if it's the father, if we ask him to leave, or frankly, if it would have uh, an extraordinarily harmful effect on them uh, to testify, because I can appreciate the trauma assessments and the information that I have ahead of me. Uh, I just wonder if there is a professional that could be directly asked the question of whether or not the testimony uh, in court in front of the father would be uh, harmful. It's something I don't have firsthand knowledge to answer that question, but I can definitely explore that to see if we do have somebody. Typically, I know we use Brene Moore a lot for that, but being that the children are in Wayne County, um, I can always inquire with the therapist who has been working with the family, as well as the assigned worker that you know helps with facilitating that kind of thing in Wayne County to see if they have a program up there that could help us with that. Thank you. All right, so Ms. Thomas, are you um, maintaining that the oldest child is not part of the conversation because uh, that child is over the age of 16 or are you asking for interventions on behalf of that child as well? Your Honor, the, uh, the motion is for all children under the rules of evidence, but if the court does not find that that's sufficient um, and we move under the juvenile code, then I would be asking in the alternative for the three that are under the age of 16. Mr. Lizahoom, did you wish to add any further argument? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, frankly, I would like to see if there is a, a counselor or professional person that is um, has more uh, experience and education in the area of mental health treatment uh, than I do, frankly, or any of us do, uh, to weigh in, in on this question as it relates to whether or not it would be uh, an extraordinary uh, risk of harm to the mental health of the children to uh, have to testify in person. I would like that, that counselor, if possible, to also uh, speak to whether or not simply appearing by Zoom uh, would be the most appropriate, or if allowing the child into the courtroom and asking Mr. Higgins to step out would be uh, necessary or appropriate as well. So I will uh, defer <laughs> on the motion and adjourn it, asking the department to secure uh, an expert on that issue. We have a little time before trial. How much time do you need in order to look into that expert? Uh, Your Honor, expert? given... Yeah, I was going to say, given how packed up all of our service providers are, I would say at least two months. Ms. Grant, would you agree with that? Or do you think we would have an answer before then? Um, I can definitely start with the counselor that's been working with them right now. I think that would be a great resources to start there to see if she can give that um, recommendation and testimony. Um, and then from there, if that's not, I would have to look into it. So I would say at least it could be anywhere from a week if she's able to do it to a month or two, if I have to look for a different service. Yes. Well, I have time April 2nd. Well, Your Honor, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Judge. Well, Your Honor, object if I went to get my calendar. No, please do. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Berger, are you available April 2nd at 10 30? Sorry, yes, I am. Okay. So, Mr. Lizzie, who back to you? I'm suggesting April 2nd at 10 30. I'm available, Your Honor. All right, so uh, I'd like to adjourn uh, the motion uh, for that reason. Ms. Thomas, would you mind directing the order to that effect? I can do that, Your Honor. Your Honor, if I get the recommendations back before that time, do you want it before that time, before a court report would be due? Uh, I think that could be useful. Yeah, absolutely. Circulate it uh, at, least, at a minimum as soon as you get it to all of your uh, all of the attorneys. 
I'm satisfied with waiting, but it doesn't matter to me. Probably not less than seven days ahead of time, if possible, but if you can get it in, then get it in. All right, any other issues for pretrial purposes today? Not you, none, Your Honor, thank you. Um, we do have a set of uh, voir dire questions for respondents, proposed jury instructions and a verdict form, as well as a set of instructions for the jury. So uh, are those the only ones that I'll be receiving? Yeah, yes, Your Honor, I was gonna amend my actually instructions to change the burden of proof. But yes, those are, aside from the burden of proof issue, those are the ones from that we submitted for a respondent. Uh, for the department? Uh, Your Honor, yes, the department submitted um, standard jury instructions uh, that are inclusive of a verdict form for each child. And we also submitted proposed voir dire questions. Um, it was my understanding we were uh, supposed to work as a group to submit one set of those documents, um, but that did not happen. So that is all that the department will be submitting um, and we'll take further guidance from this court on that matter. There they are, yes, okay. I'm sorry, I didn't, either they didn't print it or I didn't see that. All I have in front of me as far as what you're representing is the actual stack of papers that starts with the instructions. And then I see now that at the back of that you do have the verdict form and the questions, but I was unclear on who had submitted those. So thank you for clarifying. All right, Ms. Berger, uh, could we expect anything from you? I'll have nothing to add, Your Honor. All right, very good. Uh, any objections to the voir dire questions or the uh, verdict forms or anything else needs to be uh, noticed up. We'll be, I'll be making final decisions on that as well. Let's set that for the April 2nd hearing. Um, I'll go through these between now and then as well uh, to determine if there's anything that's so inappropriate that I myself have to weigh in and say no to that particular question. Uh, but I would encourage the attorneys to review all of those documents and um, place anything in writing that you may feel you need to for purposes of objecting to those questions, instructions, or forms between now and April 2nd. Thank you, Judge. All right, I believe that's all for this afternoon. Uh, it's been um, noticed to all interested parties that we have a we had a pretrial review today. Uh, I do find the department is meeting its obligations for uh, reasonable efforts under the circumstances. That Ms. Berger is uh, well. We didn't actually have a report from you today, Ms. Berger. Did you want to give a report? I believe I gave one um, at the hearing a couple of weeks ago. All right, I, I do recall that, yes. Any updates? Nope, nothing bad. Very good, all right. I do find that she's in satisfaction of her obligations uh, as guardian ad litem, and that the children are in the safest and least restrictive placement with mother uh, pending the resolution of the initial uh, adjudication and disposition in this case. None of the exhibits that were provided today will be uh, usable at the trial obvious reasons and I look forward to further developments on the motion and any other issues on April 2nd unless there's any questions that will be up for today.